Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to serve as Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge. My name is Stephen Toop, and it is a real privilege uh, to be with you this afternoon and to welcome you to what promises to be a thought-provoking discussion. I hear that the uh, day-long sessions have been extraordinary and stimulating, and I'm convinced that this has been the most wonderful way we could imagine to launch the Bennett Institute of Public Policy, a unique center that will address some of the most pressing challenges of our era. Our distinguished guests today are very well-known entrepreneurs and people who've contributed greatly to public policy in their personal and public capacities. They're inspirational leaders whose influence, both national and international, has been vast. Mustafa Suleiman and Baroness Martha Lane Fox are two people who care passionately about both technology and people and the people who use technology. And each of them has helped change the world in their own ways for the better. Mustafa Suleiman helped launch the Muslim Youth Helpline at the age of just 19 and went on to be a policy officer on human rights for the mayor of London. He co-founded DeepMind, an artificial intelligence company, and has worked as a negotiator and facilitator for government and non-government organizations in many parts of the world. Baroness Martha Lane Fox has a CV that includes launching lastminute.com and other business ventures and leading the way on public service ventures and charities aimed at digital education for the entire British population. She joined the House of Lords in 2013. So we're going to start with a talk from Mustafa and uh, then we'll hear from uh, Martha and then we'll have an opportunity for a discussion. So over to you, Mustafa. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Um, so good afternoon, everybody, and, and, and thank you for, for having me at the launch of uh, this institute. Um, about eight or nine years ago now, after working in, in government, in think tanks and the charity sector, trying to tackle some of the most intractable social challenges, it became clear to me that the complexity of our social systems was far outstripping our collective capacity to intervene. I had just finished a, a year-long piece of facilitation work at the Copenhagen climate negotiations in 2009, where we were collectively struggling to understand the very basics of the issues before us, let alone make sense of the causes of the crisis ahead, or even suggest meaningful practical uh, policy solutions. Traditional vehicles for addressing climate change, various meetings of minds, grassroots campaigning, high-level political negotiations, waiting for spontaneous market-driven outcomes were, to put it bluntly, not working fast enough. Time and again, we found ourselves failing to come to grips with the dizzyingly complex world, with groups of the smartest experts struggling to make sense of the relationship between cause and effect. And of course, climate change is just one of the many strands of a complex, interdependent, and dynamic set of problems that we face as a species. If we don't tackle these challenges, the future of humanity and, and the planet is at best uncertain, and at worst, an extremely grim prognosis. And yet, we're struggling to innovate within the confines of a political and economic system that grew out of a different age, and frankly needs radically rethinking. If we're going to address the world's greatest needs, we need new institutions that combine the rigorous and expansive thinking that we most often find in academia with the social justice ethic of the, of the non-profit sector and the speed of execution and scale that you most often find in companies. And that's exactly why I chose to start DeepMind. I wanted to build an organization with the capacity to keep pace with a changing world and make a real impact at scale, with an ethical mission underp underpinning our work, and of course the resources needed to invest for the very long term. And I think that's why our organization is dedicated to boosting our powers of comprehension and cognition to help us solve society's most pressing challenges. And that to me is the true value of distilling what has made us so effective as a species, our intelligence, and recreating it within the digital world. But frankly, that's all currently a long-term aspiration. Today, it's clear 
that technology is rapidly losing society's trust. And I do passionately believe that scientific breakthroughs facilitated by AI technology could make the crucial difference by helping us to discover new kinds of knowledge, new ideas and strategies in the areas that matter most to us all. But at the same time, history has shown us that the benefits of technological advances take time to reach society very broadly. And that transition period from scientific breakthrough to real world impact can at times exacerbate inequality and further entrench um, social disenfranchisement. The long time promise of our market based system over the last few hundred years has been that technological advances will be most efficiently and broadly disseminated using this market based system of incentives. And in many respects, this has certainly been the case. The rise in living standards and the reduction in suffering that we saw in the 20th century was clearly phenomenal and undoubtedly without historical precedent. But at the same time, four decades of wage stagnation in the West, combined with hyper growth in inequality, as well as significant failures to address critical commons challenges, like those of climate change and global water shortages, have left us asking the obvious question at DeepMind, Will AI accelerate this trend, or does it represent a spectacular opportunity to take things in a new direction? I look forward to discussing some of these questions in the Q&A, but for now I'll say that I'm an optimist out of necessity and a skeptic by instinct. I do believe that in the long term, AI offers an enormous opportunity for us to collectively rethink some of the fundamentals of society. But I also struggle with the fact that in order to make it something profoundly different to previous forms of capital, we need to hold its design and use to the very highest ethical standards and the most modern and innovative forms of governance. And that is going to continue to be extremely hard. That's part of the reason why we started DeepMind Ethics and Society, which is our own research unit within DeepMind, dedicated to thinking about these questions. And we're incredibly lucky to have Diane Coyle serve as one of our independent fellows to help guide our work and advise us. Now, it's clear that this year, I think, is a pivotal moment for those, those of us working at the intersection of technology and public policy. I've certainly dedicated my entire career to working on social impact and public policy in practice. And the recent sea change, at least in the rhetoric, around the importance of ethics and governance of technology, especially AI, has been pretty staggering and, of course, very encouraging to see. When we started DeepMind in, in 2010, our stated mission was to build safe and ethical AGI, artificial general intelligence. And even academics and professors in, in most computer science departments thought that we were pretty nuts to be talking about artificial general intelligence. And, and even outside the, the sort of ivory tower of academia, the understanding around narrow AI, let alone the important questions of safe development, ethical use, good governance, and so on, was extremely limited. Now we're at a time when AI and ethics features front and center on the lips of corporate leaders and policymakers all around the world. Theresa May recently called on the importance of, quote, seeking safe and ethical artificial intelligence at her speech in Davos. And Macron only just a few weeks back announced a billion and a half euro investment in AI through 2022. So it's certainly been exciting to see the conversation over the last couple of years finally shift away from superintelligence and Skynet to the real important practical issues of fairness and discrimination of our algorithms, algorithmic control and oversight, accountability, ownership, data, governance, and, and so on and so forth. However, I think as is absolutely clear from the last few months and indeed years, the industry is now experiencing a long overdue wake up call. Whilst many technology companies began with altruistic mindsets, good intentions are clearly no longer enough. And that's because ethical outcomes in tech depend on far more than algorithms and data. They depend on the quality of our societal debate and genuine accountability, something which I hope we'll talk about later. And it's why institutions like the BIP and its interdisciplinary research agenda are so vital. We urgently need policy institutions with the capacity to participate in real time in practical conversations about the risks and consequences of the technologies that we're developing and to help ensure that all corners of society are able to anticipate and share in the impact of these technologies as they potentially have for people's lives. And so I certainly welcome BIP with open arms on this. Very briefly, I think there's probably three roles that BIP can play. First, 
helping ensure that technology companies take the diversity of users into account when building products. Tech's employee base is, is badly unrepresentative when it comes to gender, race, and most importantly, and little talked about, class. This is a major problem. And as we've seen in other fields, it risks a disconnect between the inner workings of these organizations, our organizations, which directly shape the way products are created and deployed, and the communities that those solutions seek to serve. I think BIP will be, a crucial, uh, will be crucial in ensuring that technology companies can draw on high quality, peer reviewed research, highlighting the risks of not getting this right, and in doing so ensure that the potential benefits of increased productivity resulting from technologies like AI are spread widely and fairly. Second, the Institute can help by explaining and translating how technology actually works in practice and how these systems are changing our behaviors and our attitudes every day in very profound and yet often rather opaque ways. Making this happen will require a collaborative effort between companies and research institutes, building new types of collaborations that facilitate deep understanding of how complex algorithms work and proactively considering their impacts on society before they're deployed. And we have to create open, trusting relationships with independent and critical public policy leaders who can challenge the internal thinking and culture of the tech industry, which is, to be quite honest, often way too homogenous and can appear at times tone deaf to public fears and frustrations. Third, proposing new goals and incentives for the technology industry that help yield better outcomes for everybody. Today's singular focus on the standard measures of business achievement from fundraising valuations to active users to the share price, don't in any way capture the social responsibility that comes with building technology companies like these. Silicon Valley has created a culture where the world's brightest minds gravitate towards the safest and most proven ideas and business models, prioritizing growth at all costs over social responsibility and the public interest. They end up creating new services to personalize soda drinks, when half a billion people don't have access to clean water, or new ways to order food on your phone when in fact more than 800 million people every night go malnourished. We need new incentive structures to encourage more founders to take on real world social problems and to do so with ethics at heart. There's clearly room for enormous innovation here and the private sector won't be able to fix this alone. None of this is going to be easy, but with rigorous attention to how technology is developed, and research into its inputs and to its impacts, greater transparency and a reorientation of some market incentives, I believe we increasingly have the tools to start breaking through the complexity that makes some of our most pressing social challenges so intractable. If we can deploy these tools broadly and fairly, fostering an environment in which everyone can participate in and benefit from them, we have the opportunity to enrich and advance humanity as a whole. All of us who believe in the power of technology must recognize that we can only achieve this in deep collaboration with all sections of society. So I look forward to working with Diane and the BIP on these urgent questions, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from Martha. Thank you. I feel uh, at events like this as though I should recount the anecdote that um, still haunts me, I have to be honest, at 45. I was walking down the street quite recently last year near where I live in Marylebone, and someone waved at me and said, I know you. And I thought, finally, again, I'm famous for one more second. They came over and they said, you're that, you're that dot-com dinosaur. And I thought, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, that's pretty bad in your mid-40s. But... I probably could be categorized as an extinct species because I remember a time when the internet felt as though it was going to be a very different place to the one it is now. And it still sometimes takes my breath away that we have ended up in a position and a landscape where, to me, the internet is increasingly uh, in danger of becoming even more balkanized, where, to Mustafa's point, we're going to have an even more um, gender biased, class biased, race biased creators, creators of the internet, let alone all of the things that we haven't yet grappled with around openness, transparency, accountability of the nature of the algorithms that are taking grip of our lives. And I am constantly amazed at how quickly this change has happened. 
You know, artificial intelligence at lastminute.com in 1998, 20 years ago, and pretty much to the day we launched our website, was me not uh, looking at a computer, but printing out a fax, putting it into it a machine to send to a travel agent that would then send a ticket to someone in the post. People on booking tickets on the website thought that this was some seamless process that worked miraculously. Not at all. It was artificial and the only intelligence was my limited one in managing to get it from fax to, um, to travel agent. It is unimaginable how quickly this pace of change has taken grip. And I don't hark back to 1998 because my career stopped then and I'm never going to peek at those dot-com dinosaur days again. But because I feel so and care so much about building the best possible future that we can and doing it in a way that is not naive and has got rigorous and uh, upheld accountability and standards to the people that are making such a profound impact on our lives. It is fabulous that we have good guys running DeepMind, but there are many places in the world where we don't have such clement leaders building extremely powerful technology. If I was a Chinese citizen right now, I think I might be feeling quite differently about the powers of the government to use the algorithms to build the social engineering structures that they're trying to do. I believe that we need to look at a systems approach to make sure everyone has an understanding of how this digital world will affect us. I started a um, think tank that makes stuff dot everyone that's focused a lot on how to make sure the digital world works for everyone. And we as well welcome deeply Diane and the Bennett Institute because there are still so many important conversations to be had about the world and how it is shifting. Sitting in the House of Lords, you get an interesting perspective on technology and uh, leadership. It's too easy to say that nobody understands the internet, but it is true that I am asked about why the Wi-Fi doesn't work more than practically any other question. <laughs> there are, however, a bunch of very smart and committed people who do understand a lot about how technology works. And you only need to look at the um, soon-to-be-released GDPR legislation that went through the Lords in real detail with some experts putting in huge amount of time and attention to make it the best possible legislation out of what was an enormously complex piece of EU regulation. But we still need to have, to my mind, three constituent parts in the UK and globally that come together to make sure we make the best policy decisions for the modern world. And that's where I hope this institute can play a role. We need to massively upskill our legislators and policy makers. Anyone making decisions in public life with our public money should be as ashamed to not understand how bits of the internet work as they are about not being able to read a balance sheet or understand the consequences of other bits of their actions. This was shown loud and clear when Mark Zuckerberg faced, yes, five hours of intense grilling on, at Congress. But goodness me, did any of you watch some people basically asking what his business model was? This is not okay because this is a very serious moment in history, and if they let that slide, we all face extreme consequences. So we're determined at Dot Everyone, and we'd like all the help we can get from institutes like this and beyond to make sure that we have people in public life who are as well equipped as possible to deal with the challenges they're meeting and facing. And that's as true if you're running a school as it's if you're running a huge clinical commissioning group as if you're a member of parliament. That's one piece of the puzzle. Then, of course, you need corporates to step into and up to their own responsibilities. It's fabulous to see DeepMind right from the get-go, having put ethics at the core of what they're doing. But it's not enough to say you're sorry. You have to be able to do and walk the talk as well and show your users that they can trust you. Facebook, to my mind, has got away with murder recently, and I think we need to be stronger in holding them to account. At Dot Everyone, we did some research recently, and 50% of people said that they believed that the uh, technologies around them had helped them every single day. They felt that they had improvements in their daily life at an individual level. 12% of people felt that they had contributed positively to society. That's a big disparity. So we need companies to take that on board and rebuild trust with people and help people understand the rights they have and how to use them. But we also need civil society, as Mustafa mentioned, to step into this as well. Because unless we have NGOs and charities who are also able and equipped to deal with the modern world, we're never going to be able to build that system change that I believe we need for the best possible future. 
So this is a complex puzzle. It's fabulous to welcome new organizations to help think some of these challenges through. I, for my part, believe we do have a real opportunity here in the UK, post-Brexit or not post-Brexit, to make sure that we are the most digitally literate nation on earth, because the stakes are very high. We need to be able to understand what's happening in order to shape it more effectively and to give people their real sense of control back. And I'd just like to end with a quote that I found from Churchill as we're standing here in uh, Churchill College. As I was much struck, I hadn't realized that he'd been quite such a tech visionary, but uh, he actually with, with saw the singularity before it had even been thought of in the 1970s. He wrote at a lecture that he gave in MIT in, in 1932, there's no doubt that this technological evolution will continue at an increasing rate. We know enough to be sure that the scientific achievements of the f next 50 years will be far greater, more rapid, and more surprising than those we have already experienced. But this is only the beginning. High authorities tell us that new sources of power, vastly more important than any we yet know, will surely be discovered. Well, we have someone on stage who is discovering them. I think Churchill would be happy that we are talking about this in his namesake college. Hold his feet to the fire and let's make sure we build the best possible future. Thank you. Well, thank you to both of you for, I think, setting us off in, uh, in, in a, some very challenging directions. Uh, and I know that there will be many people in, in, uh, amongst us who want to ask some questions, but I want to just focus on a couple of issues that, that you raised. You started by talking, Mustafa, about the complexity of social systems and, in a sense, our inability to work fast enough uh, to address the challenges that these social systems are experiencing and sometimes creating. And you, you talked, Martha, about failures in accountability. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious, at, at, at the macro level here, have we simply reached a point where things are moving so fast that the ability of public policy to address the challenges is outstripped? How do we get to a position where it's even plausible to imagine accountability for a, a Mark Zuckerberg in front of a, 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 a congressional committee that's serious and that isn't just grandstanding and revealing of uh, utter ignorance on the part of many of the legislators? Have we missed the opportunity, Mustafa? No, we've definitely not missed the opportunity. And I, th I think the first thing to say is, is to remind ourselves that you know, we are designing and creating these technologies. We're, we're putting these platforms out there collectively as a species. We, we have to take responsibility for the unforeseen consequences of these systems. And the way that we do that, I think, is to have you know, regulators, civil society, academics, researchers, you know, members of the public, users, <coughs> actively engaged in, in how we actually develop them and how we use them. And, and when we do get it wrong, I think companies have to be extremely responsive and very, very quickly. I think part of the challenge, you're right, is that the technologies are improving so quickly mm. that they're sort of outstripping our capacity to understand what it is they do. I mean, just setting aside AI, much has been, you know, much of the focus has been on algorithmic explainability, and that's provided a, a neat little buzzword for us to collectively focus on a specific issue of, of sort of where in a network or in a model sits a particular representation. But actually, the same issue has been present for decades before that. I mean, we, we don't really understand where many bugs sit in our large pieces of software. Software in general has this problem. Software itself hasn't been explainable or accountable, accountable for, for a long time. And, and partly that requires a technical understanding, but partly it requires this sort of real-time access to the inner workings of these platforms. And that means that companies need to, to, to essentially create semi-permeable membranes uh, around their sort of day-to-day -day operation. Um, and, and I think that's the beginning of a conversation which helps to educate people about what these things can do, but also creates a window into, uh, into oversight and to shaping these things proactively. I actually think that this is one of the moments in, in kind of regulatory history where we do actually need to start being a little bit proactive. 
I think, I think the tone of the last three or four decades has been that good regulation is reactive. After we observe the consequences of some innovation, we then sort of figure out how to pick up the pieces. I don't think we have that luxury this time round. And I think we have to start engaging in a, in a much more pragmatic, real-time conversation about how we uh, sort of oversee uh, these technologies as they're being developed and as they're being actively deployed, which they are at the moment. Yeah, I, I definitely don't think it's too late. I think uh, two comments. Firstly, you know, it makes me laugh every time I hear people on the radio say, companies like Facebook. Can you name a single other company <laughs> on the planet like Facebook? <laughs> it's the worst, most lazy use of the English language ever. There is a Facebook problem, right, I would argue. I don't think it's about breaking up Facebook, although maybe WhatsApp and Instagram over time will not be allowed to stay with the group. But I think there is something that needs to be unpicked, and it may take five years, it may take five months, but it doesn't mean it shouldn't be started now, about that company and its grip of uh, social data, and particularly, I guess, with a skew on politics and some of the things that undermine democracies. You know, I think that feels like it's going to be complicated and difficult, but that is a problem you can put in a box and try and unpick. So I would say, no, it's never too late to try that. And I also think that, you know, if I look at what is happening in Europe, and I sit on the board of Twitter, and, you know, there isn't very much interest in what happens in Europe. Not really. I think that's probably true of many Silicon Valley companies. Um, and I think that what has made a big massive bit of rah, rah, rah attention has been this data regulation and some of the things that have happened around social media regulation in Germany um, and some of the stuff that's been touted about happening here. And so I think that um, just by starting on a small scale and picking off some bits and pieces, a lot of stuff's been happening around children and their rights to different access to data and privacy and so on and advertising models, different things happening with you know terrorism and social media channels and so on. So there are examples of where bits of regulation and policy is moving and shifting. And I think it's quite easy to feel like it's such a huge intractable problem, but actually you just have to start and do some. And then hopefully that will break apart some of the ways that we do it. But if I can pick you up on, yeah. on perhaps the difference that you've noted between yeah. Europe and yeah. uh, the United States in particular. There is a huge impetus in American politics and public life around yeah. deregulation. So you're yeah. both now advocating the need for proactive regulation. The rhetoric from much of the private sector and certainly from the current uh, governmental leaders in Washington is not so much around the need for regulation as further deregulation. Uh, and I'm just, uh, I'm just curious how you think politically this sells. Well, I think you're right, but I actually think it was interesting listening to the congressional hearings about how even Republican questioners were quite tough about competition regulation and privacy mm -hmm. regulation. And, you know, I think there was an interesting combination there. And what ultimately I think will be one of the triggers will be both enlightened self-interest, as in they will be anxious about whether or not their own results and ability to be re-elected is going to be affected by some of this stuff, mm -hmm. but also their voters and people they talk to. And there is no doubt, as Mustafa highlighted, the mood has shifted. You know, if you think of um, Europe as sort of, Germany is always on the extreme in kind of anxiety about technology mm -hmm. and surveillance and companies. The UK is always kind of pictured as being somewhere in the middle and the US a bit more lax, but data I've seen has shown they are all coming more closely together and there has been a shift in people's anxiety levels about this stuff and the lightning rod that everybody could sort of understand was the Cambridge Analytica stuff. So I, I slightly disagree with you. I think this could be a moment where they think just actually because of our own futures we're going to have to act and do something here. Well, I mean, I think the thing to add to that is that good regulation provides a lot of clarity and you know, business likes that. I mean, I, I think it is actually possible to you know, design technical solutions to give us the kind of accountability and oversight that we collectively currently feel we need. Everybody is talking about fairness and, and accountability of our algorithms. Well, it's possible to design technical solutions to that. I mean, we've been working on a research project called Verifiable Data Audit for a couple of years now, maybe two and a half years. And it's essentially the idea is to uh, create a glass box around a particular data store such that um, for any edit to a, to a named data set or any read of that data or view or access or any third party licensing of that data, um, each one of those actions should increment uh, a, a verifiable, a cryptographically verifiable, untamperable log uh, around that data and to the extent that any one of those uses of the data is inconsistent with a named policy 
it could be a contract, it could be terms of service, it could be a piece of legislation, then that will automatically flag to the controller of the data or even the owner of the data that there has been a potential violation of, 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 of rights. And I think that's a crucial missing piece in creating the accountability and transparency we're all talking about. It doesn't solve the whole problem because the fundamental question is what is the policy and who gets to update the policy and who gets to audit it. And there's all sorts of derivative questions. But there are good, immediately available, I think, technical solutions which at huge scale could fundamentally change the way that we interact with this new thing, you know, called data. That would be a foundation of transparency, which I think would be a very good thing. Mm. My background's in international law, and I struggle a lot to try to imagine how we are going to do an effective job in coordinating the kind of regulation that both of you uh, are talking about. So you've noted, Martha, that there have been national differences uh, in regulatory approaches to date. Uh, both of you seem to be suggesting that we may be getting to some point of convergence where it becomes easier to define uh, across national boundaries regulatory frameworks that will be acceptable. Just describe that process to me a little more. How do you think that can actually happen? We haven't been very good at that so far. We're bad at it in financial services. Uh, we often have conflicting. We're pretty bad on even uh, anti-competition or pro-competition policies. Uh, why do you think we might get this right uh, in technology and data protection? Mm. I, I think it's, um, it's urgent, and as Martha says, people experience and intuit the urgency in a new way, particularly over the last six months. And I, I think that will create... What about climate change? I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but hasn't there been a sense of urgency and anxiety around that? And we've also had, as you suggested earlier, a lot of trouble getting to any kind of shared approach. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt about it. I, th I think that there is a renewed urgency and basic understanding for what the, the kind of scale of the Facebook issue has shown us is, is, is a kind of you know, set of powers that sit in, in private hands. And I, I think that is going to create a, a level of... Uh, and has created a level of understanding which previously wasn't quite there. We certainly didn't see it you know, in the way that we might like to have post Snowden, for example. Mm. Uh, and, and, I'm, and sadly, we, we never quite saw it around climate. People really struggle to intuitively connect with consequences which are both far away in space and time. It's hard to really emotionally connect with the ocean, uh, you know, the, the big plastic bag islands in the ocean or the, the sort of dying skinny polar bear. And, you know, the, this is a real problem that we as a species are really bad at. Um, uh, I think there's, a, there's an urgency that has been created by the Facebook affair, which does represent an opportunity and a willingness among many of the tech leaders. I mean, Zuck himself, for example, uh, acknowledging that now is the time for us to, to, to address these challenges. I think the other thing is, you know, where do you draw the kind of boundary around that consensus? We're not quite talking about a complete agreement between 196 nations. And actually, I think we should, we should look at the kind of sort of China direction with, with trepidation. Um, I'm, I'm very reluctant to participate in the kind of othering that I see a lot of people creating around the threat that is China, the rising power, and the way that they've handled privacy. But at the same time, I'm cautious and critical of the you know, very close relationship between companies and the state that we see in China. And I think we should be very cautious about that in the West. But it's highly unlikely that we're going to achieve consensus between you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of Europe and, and, and the US and China on issues of privacy. And we have to accept that that may mean uh, you know, a somewhat balkanizing of, of the web in a way that we have spent the last couple of decades thinking that this is naturally going to be a much more open, uh, universal system. I think that's a question that we, we now have to start thinking about. And I somewhat challenge you that because this is an interconnected landscape, we need to have interconnected regulation. Mm -hmm. right. Says the uh, complete novice to the international law professor expert. But what I mean by that is I still, think, I still think that taking climate change as an example, of course you're right, you know, arguably... That's the only thing the Bennett Institute should focus on because it's the biggest and most pressing thing and otherwise game over for all of us. So you know, I take the point. But if you look at what individual nations have done and you look at the combination of you know, the um, Paris Climate Accord and then even with America leaving it, the relatively local uh, determination to continue with some of the goals. And then you look at what we've been doing here around oceans and building marine reserves and actually creating the biggest overseas territory of um, marine protective areas where British um, waters are 
uh, owned by um, the British government still. So, you know, you can still have effective um, progress with a small and incremental set of steps that might not seem like they're addressing the whole. And I think that very often my perception over the last year is that because people feel like this is way too complicated and is impossible to unravel, we can't do anything. But that's just not right. I think it's really important just to start and to use, you know, technical language just to keep trying to iterate and try and move things on as in ch chunks that you can. So would you advocate then that there be national regulatory approaches that might not be coordinated? I think there have to be just to start. And you know, the EU is, you know, <laughs> I can't believe we've got this far in. I haven't talked about Brexit. We're 35 minutes in. <laughs> but, you know, that's, I'm not going to talk about it, but I am going to say, you know, that was one of the great uh, and incredible things that you could have this coordinated response to regulation. And to my point about the EU um, data protection regulation being picked up now in the US, I think there is an opportunity perhaps that um, legislators there are thinking, well, actually, that doesn't look like such a crazy piece of regulation. We'll pick a bit of that off. So even if it's not the whole piece and it's not completely coordinated, they will have educated each other about the successes and failures. Well, and I, I also think that regulation needs to learn to yes. move much more quickly exactly. and be more experimental yeah. and acknowledge that, yeah. you know, it, it may not get everything right. There may, may be slight yeah. mistakes, but there has to be a, a much faster iteration cycle with the companies. And the good thing is there's a willingness among the companies to try things out. Like we, mm -hmm. For example, a, a DeepMind Health, uh, on, on the day that we launched DeepMind Health, we announced that we'd be creating a panel of independent reviewers to, mm -hmm. quote, scrutinize us in the public interest. And you know, that's been a reasonably successful experiment, haven't always got things right, um, which has involved nine highly credible independent experts straddling across the disciplines and sectors who you know, have, have, have we've actively invited to come and look at our technical systems, to scrutinize our, our, our contracts, to look at our products, to look at our data, and so on and so forth. And, and you know, make a, a public statement about their sense of what we're missing and what we're seeing. We've invited that critical, criticality. And, and I think that's a, a first small experimental step, like Martha says, to, to trying to get this right, knowing that we, we need to, to, to start to do this in what looks closer to, to real time um, than, than sort of these huge five-year slow cycles. You talked right at the beginning about the importance of bringing together uh, thinking through academic work, uh, deep, deep thinking through academic work, ethics through civil society, uh, speed of innovation through the private sector and how you were attracted to trying to pull that together. I mean, in a sense, I, I think that's what this panel in many ways is all about, is trying to figure out how we pull that together. What do you see the barriers to be? You've each had experience in the private sector, in civil society, in government, in your case, um, what, what gets in the way? And, and is there something that we should be thinking about in the university world uh, that might actually facilitate better connectivity? I mean, I, I think one thing is that the, the public and governments in general need to get much more comfortable making very, very large investments in new spaces. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about um, AI and its importance with respect to the public interest and so on. Uh, but the, if you actually look at the scale of the investment, it's, it's pitiful. It's really small. And I think um, we have to, to back up our collective um, concern around the need for accountability and for greater governments with real investment um, in institutes like this, but also in the regulators themselves. I mean, it's really important that there are senior engineering technical experts in the heart of all of our public agencies. Uh, and that needs to happen right now and will require really significant investment. Uh, it's moving far too slowly at the moment. So those sorts of things will fundamentally transform uh, the industry's ability to, to communicate, if you like, with, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the kind of shared language with, um, you know, the civil society and the public agencies. Martha. I mean, I just think that it's still, my perception is that the public sector, the private sector, and the, the third sector, I don't like that phrase very much, they just don't talk very much. And even in you know, my 25, 30 years of working, it feels as though they've moved marginally closer together in some areas, but not very deeply. And there are not very many opportunities to bring them together with profound impact as opposed to just a chat. Mm. And I know that if, you know, if you're working in a small charity and you're feeling up against it, then you want money from the private sector and you want resources and help, but you can spend a lot of time talking to them and giving them advice and not really getting anything back. So I think we need to be brought together in more constructive ways to face up together challenges that we face. You know, we were talking earlier about the um, 
industrial uh, strategies, grand challenges. And I think that could have been an opportunity for government to try and actively manage to bring interesting groups together to solve the problems rather than just giving you know, the same old people the same old bits of money and hopefully they might. So I think that it just isn't coordinated very well and choreographed very well. It's still quite difficult if you're sitting in government to know uh, the exciting entrepreneurship stuff that's happening. It's quite difficult if you're and, and innovate using those um, those companies. You know, just look at the public procurement process, for example. It's, it's hideous. That would be your interface into some of those things. Well, then you look at the other side of that, and you think about um, the small charities trying to reach big companies, and that's also a very, very hard thing to have interface. So I think government can help by being active and managing some of these things, and you know, organisations, again, like this, really encouraged to try and be as little silo thinking as possible, because it's so fundamental. Great. Thank you.